guys, Nick from Octave Level 7 here again. So today I wanted to continue with part two on the series of chlorine, chloramine, and dechlorinators. Now, in the first part we had a basic chemistry lesson, so in this part we're going to look at the effects chlorine and chloramine uh, can have on our aquarium inhabitants. Now before we do that, uh, I wanted to address a few quick housekeeping issues. Uh, first, thank you to everyone who subscribed. Um, I just passed the 100 subscriber mark, um, so that's pretty cool, and I uh, just really appreciate all the views, uh, comments, subscribers, so, so thanks really. Um, Second, uh, I think I came across overly negative on update videos in my last video I posted. Uh, really all I meant was that I'm not going to focus on that in my channel. Not that I won't ever post an update video, I will, and um, I, you know, we all enjoy seeing each other's tanks and that's a big part of this community, so uh, I also like being able to see how my own tank changes over time, so uh, I didn't mean to sound so negative. Finally, I wanted to give a quick shout out and thanks to Cyber Aquarist who pointed out uh, a lot of water treatment facilities still use chlorine, uh, so chloramine may not be as widespread as I previously mentioned. Um, I'll post a link to his channel um, down in the description, but I'm sure everyone's actually already subscribed to his channel. Alright, so on to the topic of the day. Now, most of the data out there on toxicity of chloramine involves freshwater organisms, which is fine, I'm a freshwater guy myself, um, but uh, there is also some data on its effects on saltwater organisms, so I thought I would mention that as well. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about it is chloramine and chlorine react with substances in seawater um, and can actually form other reactive chlorine species. Now for chlorine, these are usually referred to as chlorine-produced oxidants, or CPOs, uh, for example, monochloramine is known to react with bromide in seawater um, just within a couple of hours and forms uh, bromochloramine. Anyways, so more to the point, why is chloramine toxic? Well, for invertebrates, we really don't know or we don't have a complete answer. But for fish, uh, chloramine passes through the gills and enters the bloodstream. There in the blood, it reacts with hemoglobin, forming methemoglobin, now remember back to your biology uh, days of high school, hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen and transporting it throughout the body. Uh, so take fathead minnows for example. Now when they were exposed to one part per million of monochloramine, about 30% of the hemoglobin was converted into methemoglobin. The fish then suffer from anoxia, which is just a fancy way of saying low oxygen throughout their bodies. Uh, because they've lost uh, that hemoglobin, the oxygen uh, carrying capacity of the blood. Now, while knowing the exact species of chloramine causing toxicity is important to biologists, it's not so important to us. Now, what we really want to know is how long, uh, excuse me, how low the concentration needs to be um, before signs of uh, any toxicity are observed in our tank inhabitants. Now, most toxicity tests are designed with really unmistakable upper endpoints, which is often death. Now, in the case of um, the Canadian equivalent of the EPA, uh, they determined the estimated no effects value to be 0 0.002 parts per million of chloramine, which is much more important to us. That's the no effects value. So that really begs the question of how much chloramine should you allow in your aquarium? Now, without knowing the toxicity of chloramine to every inhabitant of the aquarium, a good rule of thumb is to have chloramine levels far below where the most sensitive organisms are killed. So that would be well below 0 0.005 parts per million, thus the 0 0.002 parts per million suggested by the Canadian version of the EPA uh, seems pretty reasonable, and it's reasonable for both fresh and salt water. Now unfortunately it gets more complicated because there's not a lot of data concerning uh, the acceptable limits for daily exposures during the entire lifetime of an organism. At least logically it makes sense that it needs to be lower than, than this value we mentioned before. Now, depending on the species, some organisms can live quite a long time, which would mean a longer exposure, and we're interested in preventing all toxicity, not just death. So as an aside, I was able to find a little bit of data on freshwater plants. Uh, for the plant water milfoil, I'll put up the species name, uh, it showed reduced growth, af excuse me, reduced growth after just 96 hours exposure to 0.5 parts per million of chloramine. And for a green algae, chlorella, I'll put up that name as well, it showed a 50% reduced growth rate just after a 24-hour exposure to 1.8 parts per million of chloramine. Okay, so can we measure chloramine? Well, the short answer is yes, but not always easily. So there's a lot of kits available for measuring chloramine, but the limits of detection can really vary quite a bit. 
Uh, many of these are really not suitable for testing the low levels necessary um, when we're talking about our aquariums. Now there is one kit that I found with really good reputation that's capable of measuring relatively low levels of chloramine, um, though I've not personally used it. It's Hatch or Hack CN70, and I'll put up a part number and, and link down in the description, but heads up, it's pricey. What makes it really cool though is it's capable of measuring total chlorine and free chlorine. Chloramine is then found by calculating the difference between these two values. Uh, this kit has a low scale that runs from 0 to 0.7 parts per million, and a high scale that runs from 0 to 3.5 parts per million. The low range can detect as little as 0 0.01 parts per million of chloramine. Alright, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. Now, this is pretty interesting, but I know most of us, well, none of us are really going to start testing for chloramine. But I still found it kind of interesting to do the research, and I hope I haven't bored anybody too much. And as always, uh, if you haven't, please consider subscribing to my channel. And please, please take a fraction of a second to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. And if you didn't enjoy the video, hit the dislike button. But better yet, leave me a comment and let me know what or why you didn't like the video. I really do read all the comments and try to incorporate feedback where I can. Alright, thanks for watching today and I will see you in the next part where I will talk more about dechlorinators and how to use them in our aquarium and what they do. Alright, thanks for watching.